So kom ons praat so bykie, and I must just, uh, when I start with this presentation, I must tell you, Fossi and myself, we did not compare notes. But yeah, there are a lot of slides that will be similar. So yeah, if you look at the, the title there, Principles of Fertilization, I first thought, you know, and I know why you, you did it, Peter, but um, for me it's a really boring title, because that's about Agronomy 101. So I, there's a little bit of a, a different approach now. I will show you throughout the presentation what the, the approach will be. So we'll talk about best management practices uh, for fertilization, the basics of a fertilizer recommendation. I prefer fertilizer proposal. And then I also discuss approaches to liming uh, further on. And then you see that's a big fall. And I'm going to discuss a few pitfalls. Because we are doing things out there that we don't know what we are doing. And Fossi, thanks for your presentation. I think you're the first laboratory guy who will admit that there's a range of numbers. Because when you phone the, the laboratory manager and you tell him, Sir, there's a fault in your laboratorium, then you're in big trouble. Because they don't know, they don't make mistakes. You can't tell him, I think there's a drift in the laboratory. That he will accept. But not the word error. That's the wrong word to use. So yeah, thanks. Uh, that was really a fantastic presentation, uh, Fossi. Thank you for that. So yeah, the best management practices, let's start there. Uh, or nutrient stewardship, this is from IFA. The goal of fertilizer best management practices, or BMPS, is to match nutrient supply with crop requirement to optimize yield, not to maximize yield. There's a difference between maximum yield and optimum yield. The approach that we follow in, 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 at Fertaza or in, in fertilizer studies is that we must optimize yield, meaning that we aim for maximum economic yield. We must take the economy into account because farmers must make money. And that is while minimizing nutrient losses to the environment. We, we're responsible and we must act responsibly towards the environment. We can mess up the environment if we don't act responsibly. So those are, that, those, that's the, the definition. Then further, those, they are the four R's, and I think you know these, I will just go through, quickly through them. We must use the right source, the right rate, the right time, and the right place. So let's discuss, or let's look at those. The right source, are you going to use dry fertilizer, liquid fertilizer, foliar fertilizer, organic fertilizer? Which nitrogen source or carrier are you going to use? Um, there are a lot of numerous products on the marketplace, and that's what you must decide. Use the right source for that specific farmer. Then the right rate, and we will discuss that later on in, in, the, in uh, the guidelines and uh, compiling a guideline. So let's keep that for a moment. The right time, pre-plant, with plant, after plant, or top dressing. And you will see there that the pre-plant is in red. There's a practice nowadays that a lot of farmers are pre-planting fertilizer. And the reason for that is that the farmers become bigger and bigger, and then, therefore, they must apply some of the fertilizer pre-plant just to use a limited amount of fertilizer at planting. So they plant, can plant quicker with less tractors and planters. As specifically in the western part of the country on those sandy soils, we're playing with fire. It doesn't matter what nitrogen source we use, Soil acidity, if you pre-plant fertilizer, is a problem. And we must be aware. I think we are sitting on a time bomb there in the, in the western part. We must be very, very, very careful about pre-plant of fertilizer. Then at the right place, deep placement, what they do there, they, deep, uh, they, deep, uh, they, 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 they place the, the fertilizer deeper than normal. Um, and pre-plant, so it's a combination of those two, and then all band placement, all broadcast. And we know that in, in general terms, 
Band placement is more effective than broadcast application. We know that. Uh, and okay, and when we band place fertilizer, we must be aware of the maximum amount of fertilizer that we can band place uh, because of the salt effect and burning effect and all those things. So what about a fertilizer recommendation or a fertilizer proposal? To make, a sound fertilizer, to make sound fertilizer recommendations, they must be based on scientifically sound trials, not a lack of warm gevoel what you create. Because some people say, no, man, that works. And then you ask me why. You must get it seen. That's not good enough. That's not good enough. So it must be based on scientifically sound trials, should produce an increase in yield and or quality. There must be an advantage. The farmers must make more profit. Or it must be economically viable without degrading the environment. Profitability and the environment. Those two things. That watch me. We must watch up. Watch out. So what? How do you make a fertilizer recommendations? You know that. For see again, it's a triangle. You don't only use a triangle in the lab. You need a yield target, a guideline, and a soil analysis to make a fertilizer recommendation. Now about the yield target, we can we can talk a lot. Must you use the average over the last five years? Or must we use what we think it will be? I personally think the best method is you can if you can measure the, the water in the soil, and then you would look at the, the forecast for the season, and then you must decide what the yield is that you are going to use. Then the second one, the second one is the, the soil analysis, and that's a tool. That's a tool that we can use. And we all know that the soil sample must be representative of the area under investigation. I'm not going into detail because we haven't got time for that. And that's another thing, and Fossi also mentioned that. Plant available nutrients, those nutrients that plants can absorb. Nutrients that can be taken up by plants. That's plant available. Extractable nutrients, those nutrients that are removed with an extractant from the soil complex and measured in the laboratory. That's not plant available. A lot of people think that the number what you get on your soil sample report, that's plant available. It's not. It mimics the plant. But it's extracted by a specific extractant. And that's why, they, that's why there are different numbers for different extractants. Calibration curves links the plant's reaction, yield or quality, with the extractable nutrients in the soil and is used to determine threshold values. There must be a link between extractable nutrients and crop response or crop productivity. If you haven't got a calibration curve, then you are sitting with a number and you can do nothing with it. So as an Afrikaans say, you have no the bus gevang. And now we don't know what to do with the market. And then we can do all the plans, all sorts of plans. And we can be very, very creative. So yeah, and I will, I will show you later how we determine threshold values. A lot of people, they use the term critical value. There's nothing critical about that value. The plant will not die. If the critical value is 25 milligrams per kilogram, the plant will not die when it's 23. Fossey showed us it can be anything from 20 to 30 or something like that. They can be 40% out and they're still satisfied. Then, the use of soil test results without applic applicable calibration curves can lead to financial losses, increase risk, and can cause harm to the environment. And that's a big, big pitfall. Don't use a soil test result without a calibration curve. And the work in South Africa is mainly on Bray 1 and ammonium acetate. But now, if they use Mielich 3, it's cheaper. 
I will show you later on, it's not cheaper. And even worse, they sent it to, what, do you, what did you call it, Brokefield or whatever? Broke, Brokefield Laboratory in the USA. Because they're so fantastic. Guys, we've got fantastic laboratories in South Africa. Why paying that dollars to use the American laboratory? Next one, we've got other tools. Visual symptoms suggest the presence of deficiencies that can be misleading. I'm always amazed if a guy walks into a field and he will tell the farmer, Mr. Farmer, you've got a nitrogen deficiency and a zinc deficiency and a manganese deficiency. And I thought, sure, this guy is good. You can't do that. Yeah, are there, there are typical symptoms for nitrogen and potassium and so on. But there are a few deficiencies in one crop. You're in trouble. There are certain physiological problems that will give you exactly the same symptom as a nutrient deficiency. But then we are selling fertilizer. We must take a leaf tissue analysis can be used to confirm possible deficiencies and is crop as well as growth stage specific. We know that. So that's a quick one. We can also use SAP analysis. It's a snapshot in time which gives you an indication of the nutrient content at that specific moment. You can, you can take a SAP sample now, day one, and you can take a SAP sample tomorrow and it will, it will be different. So what you must do, you must take a few samples in series and look at the trend. One must be very careful when you interpret SAP samples. Use the trend rather than the exact value. The, the, the next one is the guideline. A soil test must be correlated, calibrated, and interpreted correctly for a specific crop. There are three steps. Correlation, calibration, and interpretation. Those are the three steps. So step one is correlation is determine the best extracted. Then you look at repeatability and robustness and what else did you, there's a long list of them, right? Eh? Step two, calibration. There you determine the relationship between a plant nutrient and crop productivity. Very, very important. And then you also determine a threshold value, but we will discuss this later. And then step three is the interpretation part. We interpret the, the, the threshold value uh, to create a guideline. That's what we do there. What about the correlation? And I'm just mentioning a few extractants. For pH, we use water, uh, calcium chloride, or KCl. For, Bray, for, Bray, for, for P, it's Bray 1, Bray 2, Ambig 1, Ambig 2, Olsen, Citric Acid, Truach, Mielich 3, 3 water, etc., etc. For cations, Ammonium acetate, Ambig 1, Ambig 2, KCl, Mielich 3. For sulfur, calcium, phosphate, ammonium acetate, Mielich 3. Micronutrients, DTPA, EDPA, HEL, Ambig 1, Ambig, Ambig 2, and for boron, water, water. Now again, if you use, you will see there, you can analyze different values, uh, uh, different nutrients, uh, with, for example, with, with uh, Mielich 3. You will see there. And also micronutrients with merely three. So that one extractant, you can extract all those and get numbers. So what will they tell the farmer? Mr. Farmer, if we use merely three, it's cheaper. About 90 rand a sample. Because now we can get this and this and this and this with, with one analysis. So what the laboratory must do, they only use an extractant they use for pH value and Mielich 3, only two extractants. If you want to use the calibration curves, most, most of the time you must do, let's say, KCL pH, you must do a P extractant, Bray 1, for cations, ammonium acetate, for micros, DTPA, and for boron what water. Six extractants versus two. 
therefore it will be more expensive. But now you're getting the right values, plus minus, of course. Correlation phase, and, and I, I think you discussed that already, Fossi. Uh, if you look at those two extractants, extractant one and extractant two, which one are you going to choose? Number one, yes. Because the correlation there between plant uptake and soil extractable P is much better, the correlation there than there. That red one is all over the place. So that's what they do. They take the samples in, look at repeatability and all those things, and then they say, okay, Bray 1 or Olsen. So that's the first phase. Determine the extractor. Then we get to that graph, very important graph. That is how you determine a threshold value, and you will see there, not a critical value, it's a threshold value. So at this, on the x-axis, that's the soil test milligram per kilogram, and on that axis, relative yield. Relative yield is the actual yield divided by, for example, the maximum yield times as a percentage. The reason for that is as soon as you use relative yield, then you take a lot of variance out, and the variance between different seasons, you take that out, um, and then you get a better fit for, for your results. So first of all, normally you will use a 90% or a 95% value. If you look at 90%, then you will see, okay, the threshold value there must be, let's say, 25 milligrams per kilogram. And then some guys, what they will do, they will say, there's an upper limit for the threshold value and a lower limit for the threshold value, and they will call that the optimum range. Above the optimum range, the reaction will be random. It can be more, it can be less, it can be the same. Lower than the optimum range, there you will get a significant response on your nutrient application. That's the meaning of that, that graph. Let's say that graph and just remember that number, R squared of 0.81. Let's say the fit for that graph is 0.81. So remember it for future reference. Then there are, three, there are two, two or three different methods uh, that you can use to interpret the data. The first one is the sufficiency level. Some people will tell you you're fertilizing the crop. The soil supply nutrients to the crop with calibration studies, the fertilizer that must be applied to satisfy the needs of the crop can be calculated. So it's soil plus what you add to, for the crop to satisfy the needs. The second one is the build up and maintenance concept or philosophy. There you're fertilizing the soil, keep the soil test value above the threshold value to avoid any yield losses. So what you will see normally, the agronomist will prefer the sufficiency level and the soil scientist will go for the build up and maintenance. Because they say if you look after the soil, the soil will look after the crop. And then for cations, the third one, and that is the basic cation saturation ratio, the BCSR, fertilizing the soil to aim is to create the ideal soil in terms of percentages of the cation exchange capacity, the CEC, and to bring the ratios between cations into account. So that's the ideal soil or the balanced soil. Those three approaches, that's what you can use. No, sorry, I must apologize for this uh, Afrikaans one. Um, and I used the, the old phosphorus guideline because I just want to illustrate the point. What you will see there is optimal soil P, and that's your threshold value. In this case, the threshold value, the optimum, is between 21 and 27. So the threshold value is more or less 24, and then it will be plus minus. That's the threshold value. So that links up with the laboratory accuracy. Eh? And that's very, very important. We, we must remember, if you receive a result from the laboratory, it's not an exact number. And what some people will do, if they see that number is between 15 and 20, then they will use exactly that amount. But you must take a lot of other factors into account. That's a guideline. And from the guideline, it's pluses and minuses. But of course, if the table will tell you it must be 21p, and you are giving 40p, then you must explain. 
But if you're 21 and let's say 25 or 16, or it's fine. It's fine. It not, it's not, there's no need to be exact because we start off with not an exact soil analysis. And then all the factors, environmental factors, we must add. So that's the, the optimum P. And oof, this table. You see these tables that's published. Guys, that's dangerous stuff. And I will show you now why. Where they tell you from Ambic 1 to Bray 1 to Bray 2 to, to Citric Acids to Olsen, those are the ratios that you can use. And of course you also refer to that. I will, I will show you now why. Let's say, for interpretation, let's say this is, and I think, I just want to thank Guy Thibault from Sedara College. He gave me these graphs. Um, if you take, for example, the relationship between Ambic 2 <coughs> on that axis, X axis um, and then the Mielich 3, where they applied no lime, there you'll see it's 20, Ambic will give you 19 Mielich 3. More or less a one-to-one, -one, similar to the results that, that Fossi showed us. As soon as you applied lime, you only change one factor, pH. Now all of a sudden, that 20 Ambic 2 will become 31 Mielich 3. So where are you now? When did you sample? Before liming or after liming? What's the implication of this? The implication of this is let's say we want to build up the soil to the threshold value. So to increase the Mielich soil content with 11 um, milligrams per kilogram that you need, in fact, that must be 12, sorry for that mistake. Then you need the 12, and let's say you use only 6 kilograms of P. That's relatively low. To lift the soil by one, or increase the soil analysis with one milligram per kilogram. Then you need 72 kilograms of P. Just the, the difference in the soil analysis conversion. The implication is 72 kilograms of P per hectare in your recommendation, times 25 rand a kilogram of P. That's what we are doing. If we could try to convert from the one extractant to the other, only one example, I'm just giving you examples. Let's go back to that, that table. The one was 19, the other one was 31. In other words, if you make a soil recommendation at planting, what will you do? There you, that, that table will tell you you must apply 29, that one 15. So 29 minus 15 gives you 14 kilograms per hectare times 25 rand per kilogram. The implication for the farmer is 350 rand per hectare. So what did you want to do if you want to do to use a specific extractant to save money? Let's say the difference in the analysis cost, costed you 90 rand for that sample. So if you lose 30 kilograms of maize, only 30 kilograms at the current maize price, then it's already exactly the same. If you lose more than 30 kilograms per hectare because of your conversion, then you are losing money. I'm always referring to money because the farmers must make a profit. Because they must pay their bill, otherwise I haven't got a salary at the end of the month. If you look there, you will see a pH of less than 7, correlation, R value of 0.9, between 7.5 and 7.45, 0.67, they don't even try there to, to get a, a number. If you look to at R squared values, R squared of 0.81 and R squared of 0.45, if you convert that, those, those numbers there, the second, the second um, slide is uh, the ammonium acetate potassium on this axis, Mielich 3 on that axis. The previous one was Bray 1 and Mielich. There it's 0.88R. Let's look at the R squared values, 0 0.77, 0 0.83 and 0 0.70. So you can see there the difference between only the role that pH plays in converting these, these numbers. Let's say, you remember that correlation, that 0 0.81 for the at the beginning for the calibration curve was 0.81. That explains the meaning of that. It explains 81% 80, of the variance in the data. Correlation between extractants, 
I took the average, and the average is 0.79. It explains 79 of the variance. And if you put those two together, the implication is now you're explaining, if you use that conversion, only 64% of the variance. So you're coming down from 81 to 64. And then there are some people that use certain extractants to save the farmer money for precision agriculture purposes and then they call this precision agriculture coming down from 81 to 64 doesn't make sense that's not precision anymore but they are saving, saving money so you lose 21 percent so what's the pitfall they used in precision agriculture and I cannot see that it's precision anymore if you use that approach. Now, now the interesting one, liming. What's the definition of pH? I will go a little bit quicker now. Uh, pH is the, is, a, is the negative log of the hydrogen concentration in the soil. We all know that. And we know that there's an the effect of pH on nutrient availability and crop production is well known. So we don't argue about that one. And then different crops have different pH optima, so op optimum, so we must look at the pH. Then the second approach for, for liming is the acid saturation approach. That's the uh, exchangeable acidity uh, divided by the ECC times 100. ECC is the, is the uh, um, calculated value for CEC, that's ECC uh, times 100 as a percentage. And those, that information is from Art Farina and KZN, and the relationship between those two, you will see there um, that they said that the, the acid saturation must not be higher than, let's say, 22% um, for, that, for those specific soils. So that's another approach. Then the other approach, number three, is based on threshold values. That's where you look at optimum values and the, the or critical values or threshold values. And there you look at the concentration in the soil, milligrams per kilogram. Is that graph again? That's, what, that's how we determine that. And then the, the last one, approach four, is the cation balancing or the BCSR. It's also, some people use that. Uh, and you can see there. The main thing there is more or less the same uh, Baron Prince, uh, Baron Prince uh, 1945, 65. Graham 59, 65 to 85, Albrecht 75, 65, McLean um, is more or less the same as Bear and Prince, but they had a few uh, question marks. And then in the old book, the 20, 000, 2007 Fertilizer Handbook, it was also 65. The percentage for, milli, uh, for magnesium, 25, for potassium, 8, and then all these ratios between 1.5, and you can, you can read for yourself. That's the cation balancing approach. So what we'll see normally uh, with, um, with, cat, uh, with, with uh, fertilization of cations is that if you use the sufficiency level concept, uh, that you, the application rate will be lowest. With the maintenance of buildup, it will be higher, and with the BCSR, it will be the highest. So again, you can sell more fertilizer when you use the BCSR concept. Um, but for, for the different approaches, uh, pH, if you look only at pH alone, then you can create problems. You, it can lead to overliming in highly buffered soils like in KZN. So in those soils, if you want to correct the pH, you will apply lime and lime and lime and lime again, and you will do nothing to the pH. You cannot use that approach there. As it said, percentage, the pitfall there, you, it can lead to low soil concentrations, specifically calcium and magnesium. So what normally happens there, and, and we see it, is that they concentrate so much on the acid saturation part that they forget about the calcium and the magnesium in the soil as a nutrient. So that happens, and it happened in the past. The next one, the cation concentration, if you use that approach, be careful not to neglect pH and or acid set. You cannot also, you cannot only look at the concentration in the soil of, of the, the, the calcium and magnesium. You must also take the pH and the acid saturation into account. And then the last one, you will see there are quite a lot. BCSR can lead to overliming to a high pH, can induce micronutrient deficiency in particular, because what sometimes happens 
if you happens is that if you want to correct, for example, the calcium percentage, you apply a lot of lime and the pH is already high. So now you will increase the pH even more, and now you will be responsible for higher application of micronutrients. So you will induce micronutrient deficiencies because you incre increase the pH. So it will cost the farmer more lime and now you must apply micronutrients. That's also not acceptable. The next one there will in general result in higher application rates of cations, potassium, calcium or magnesium than other approaches. And lime is not soluble at high pH. The cations that you measure after lime application is misleading. Why? Because you're analyzing free lime. And you will feel good about it. Because now you increase the calcium percentage to the right level. But you, in fact, you are analyzing the lime itself. It cannot dissolve at those high pHs. And then the last one, if you want to use this approach, please use CEC determined in the lab and not ECEC, because it can be a difference. It can be a huge difference between the, those uh, two approaches. Solutions for liming pitfalls, take pH as a saturation, as a percentage. The concentration in milligram per kilogram into account simultaneously and limit the use of cation balancing to only to extreme situations where there are, for example, extraordinary amounts of sodium or magnesium or potassium present in the soil. Very, very limited use. It's there. We cannot ignore it, but very, very limited use. So we'll use the others. So in summary, we looked at the best management practices, the source, the rate, the time, and the place. We look at fertilizer recommendations, soil samples, target yields, and guidelines. Under guidelines, we looked at correlation, calibration, and interpretation, and beware of the pitfalls of the correlation between extractants. That's a huge pitfall. And under liming, use pH, acid saturation, soil concentration, and, and cation balancing when you determine the liming, and beware of the pitfalls as mentioned. Remember, the only thing we can do as agriculturalists is to maximize the probability for the farmer to achieve maximum profitability for a specific season. And the reason for that is we're farming with water. And that will determine the outcome. And we can only increase the probability. Thank you.